Our service is a series of winter readings from this book called All Creation Waits by Gail Boss. And our first story is about the honeybee. The snow doesn't yet cover the foot of my boot, so the walking is still easy among the hardwoods. I have my dog with me as a hearing aid. When I find a hollow oak tree, I call her and watch as she sniffs around it, hoping to see her stop and cock her head and stare intently at the trunk. If it were summer and they were here, we could both hear the hum. Now if they're here, I'm not sure even her smart, sharp ears could pick it up. What's the sound of 20,000 honeybees shivering? If they're here, all females in a winter hive, they're clustered together inside, queen at the heart of their sisterhood. The fine transparent wings they beat hard in summer's heat, a constant buzzing fan to keep the, to keep the hive from cooking. They hold now, folded and still. The tiny muscles to which those wings are attached shiver. One honeybee shivering her flight muscles does not make much heat. But 20,000 huddled together, shivering, can keep the queen and the colony's honey supply at their core at a tropical 92 degrees Fahrenheit, even as blizzard winds inches away flail the trunk. This calls for carefully timed choreography. When bees on the outside layer of the cluster feel their body temperature fall to near 42 degrees Fahrenheit, a cold that would paralyze them, they push inward toward the radiant center. The next outermost layer takes their sister's place, backs to the cold. From edge to center, center to edge, inward and outward they move, one hypnotic looping dance. At the heart of the dance lies the queen. She's every bee's reason for being. Without a queen, the colony would fall into chaos. Nurse bees grooming her pass her scent back through the ranks. It tells all the news of her health, which is their health. They smell that now she's laying no eggs. There is no brood to feed. Each bee senses that her one obligation is to give the smallest motion of her flight muscles to the collective work of keeping the queen and the colony's honey stores warm. The whole hive knows they will survive only if they shiver together. Some of them in the shivering cluster will die of old age. Had they hatched in the flowering season, their labor for the hive's survival, harvesting nectar and pollen from as much as 2,000 flowers a day, would have killed them in four weeks or less, their wings worn to nubbins. But hatched on the cusp of winter, they may live six months. They will know only the dark hive, the press of their sisters' bodies. They will never fly, never fall into a flower. They give their lives to shivering together in the dark. The tiny repetitive gestures of each added together a music beyond our hearing, sustaining a future for the community. Black Bear by Gail Boss. Walking in Northern Michigan hardwoods where I was raised restless I make myself stand still. Somewhere in these 800 acres, a black bear is sunk in sleep. A month ago already, beneath some fallen tree or stump, she dug a den, rounded to the curl of her body. She raked bits of bark and grass over its floor and eased herself in. I crouch, close my eyes, and imagine that the ball of furred muscle lax and loose somewhere nearby. For weeks before she lay herself down, her whole life had been shifting, making ready for another life. Late in summer, 
just when most berries and nuts ripened, she grew ravenous. Seven, eight hours a day, she camped in raspberry, blackberry, gooseberry, and huckleberry patches, pawing and licking fruit into her mouth. Then, to rest, dropping to her belly, breathing in the fallen gems. Cloyed of sweet, she sniffed out savory, jewelweed, swamp thistle, cattail, suffax, snacking on yellow jackets, ants, and beetle larvae along the way, finishing the day in a grove of beech nuts or hazelnuts or hickory nuts, tripling, even quadrupling her usual day's caloric intake. Still, the trusty voice inside her urged, eat, eat more. Lush, warm, the Indian summer days were lost on her. Her gaze was fixed ahead, her every move food purposed, her intention fierce and singular, until a voice prompted an utter turnaround. Let go, it said, go limp. Tree nuts and berry bushes are skeletons now, crouched in snow muffled quiet, I imagine hearing her slow breathing. I imagine smelling slow burning bear, the fat she made from all those nuts, berries, bugs, and plants, melting and fueling her sleep. She is shrinking, except in the den deep inside her body. There she is multiplying, balls of cells swelling into new forms of her. Maybe she dreams of life growing inside her. Did she foresee it all while she ate and grew? ate and grew? Did she perceive it when she lay down, whatever hints or none she had of its purpose? She knew absolutely a compelling urge. She obeyed that urge, and now, in its time, while she sleeps, it takes shape, two shapes. About a week from now, while she still sleeps, the cubs will tumble out of her, 10 ounces each and blind. They'll find her nipples and set straight to nursing. While she sleeps, they'll nurse and grow, nurse and grow, their hunger draining her body's stores. In late March, when the air warms, she'll wake slowly, imagining the moment when, spent and thin, she finds four bright eyes looking back at her. Okay, unmute yourselves for a meditation hymn. We're singing live. Mark Freund will lead us. My friends, this is my mistake. Turn your videos on, but do not unmute yourselves for our meditation hymn. We're singing live. Hang on, Mark, we'll unmute you. Mark, you have to unmute yourself, I'm sorry. Yeah, no, there it is. Am I there? You're good. Uh -huh. Okay. This song is by Wendell Berry. To know the dark, go dark, go without light, and find that the dark to bloom and sing, and to travel by dark. And dark feet and dark ways to know the dark so dark go without sight and start by that dark to go and see and to travel by dark feet dark and ways.
Heated Turtle by Gail Boss. The day is warm and bright for the first of December, but the logs of the marsh pond are bare. Spring to summer, they served on sunny days as spa to a dozen or so painted turtles. I would like, I would see them basking, splay legged, stretching their leathery necks out in full length, avid for every luscious atom of sunlight and sun warmth. Out of sight now, they've not escaped the harsher cold that's coming. The water is maybe waist deep in this pond, but a murky soup clogged with roots and plants. One day in the fall, as water and air cooled at some precise temperature, an ancient bell sounded in the turtle brain. A signal, take a deep breath. Each creature slipped off her log and swam for the warmer muck bottom, stroking away through the woven plants of stems, and she found her bottom place. She closed her eyes and dug into the mud. She buried herself. And then, pulled into her shell, encased in darkness, she settled into a deep stillness. Her heart slowed and slowed, almost to stopping. Her body temperature dropped and stopped just short of freezing. Now, beneath a layer of mud, beneath the weight of frigid water and its skin of ice and skim of snow, everything in her has gone so still she doesn't need to breathe. And anyway, the iced over pond will soon be empty of oxygen. Sunk in its bottom mud for six months, she will not draw air into her lungs. To survive a cold that would kill her, or slower so that predators would kill her, she slows herself beyond breath in a place where breath is not possible and waits as ice locks in the marsh water and howling squalls batter its reeds and brush. Beneath it all, she waits. It is her one work, and it's not easy. Oxygen depletion stresses every particle of her. Lactic acid pools in her bloodstream. Her muscles begin to burn. Her heart muscle, too, a deadly sign. That acid has to be neutralized, and calcium is the element to do it. Out of her bones, and then out of her shell, her body pulls calcium, slowly dissolving her structure, her shape, her strength. But to move to escape, requiring breath, is a place where there is no oxygen. That would suffocate her. So, though she is dissolving, Every stressed particle of her stays focused on the silver bead of utter quietude. It's this radical simplicity that will save her. And deep within, at the heart of her stillness, something she has no need to name, but something we might call trust, that one day, yes, the world will warm up again, and with it, her life. wild turkeys in summer. The odds are less than 50-50 that I'll see them on the south facing slope above the swamp. But in this season, if I'm up with the sun, I'm lucky nearly every morning. It's a short walk to the slope and I often hear the flock before I see them. To me, they sound like a litter of small puppies tussling, though naturalists hear cats and call the sound cluck purring. Ten hens are rowing through the hardwoods, stroking forward with long waddled necks. The males, the younger Jakes and the older Toms, keep their own societies elsewhere. Here, a stone's toss away. One hen sees me and yelps and all ten break into a run, surprisingly fast for creatures that look like inflated bellows balanced on sticks. Even supposing I could give chase and come close, they would then pop open their wide wings, hurl themselves into the treetops, and glare down at me, chucking their putt-putt alarm. No surprise that adult turkeys suffer no serious predators. 
even sub-zero cold doesn't trouble them. But snow, the accumulating kind, poses real threat. Snow covers the acorns, beech nuts, and hickory nuts, high energy food that they feed to their furnaces, burning hot and fast. And the snow still shallow, little impedes their nut hunt. They shovel it aside with their long and strong four-toed feet and gulp the uncovered nuts, of which there are many on this slope, which is why they camp here in winter, roosting on the big oak and limbs above. Also, these birds know that because the slope tilts south towards the sun, snow will melt more quickly from the grounded nuts. Shrewdly, they've shrunk their usual range to a small plot, this particular plot, for a winter home. Another reason for here. In a few weeks, the snow, even on this southern slope, is apt to be as high as their thighs. Each day they take its measure from the treetops. Thigh deep, no plowing through. They cackle a signal to each other and sail down slope 50 yards to the swamp edge. There, seeps, patches where warmer groundwater bubbles to the surface, grow a wild salad of winter crests and ferns. While seep greens generate little heat in the turkey gut, it's what they have here. What they'd like is a thaw. If not enough to bear the ground, than for the refreeze that, fill, that forms the walkable crust. Gingerly, they test the surface. If it holds, they quick step a hundred yards or so to a wild field, eager beads gleaning barberry, winterberry, and hawthorn bushes, always away, always ready to hurry back to the woods before the air warms and the crust gives way, shackling them. If the snow does not thaw, if it falls thick and blows, this place provides them one last recourse. They've seen that the swamp also has fir trees and fir branches make sturdy canopies to roost beneath, dry and unblown. Each hen on her branch fluffs her feathers against the cold. Together, they might sit fluffed for more than a week, burning body fat, calling reassurances to each other, especially to the youngest of slightest heft. Together, we can outlast this, right here in this sufficient place. In this season, I invite you to consider whose wisdom you most need the wild turkeys calling to each other like a choir, singing encouragement on the very coldest and most snow blown days, or the painted turtle who gives in to the urge to slow everything down, giving in to the trust that lives inside her heart deep deep in the recesses of her creature brain, that once again, the pond will thaw and she will emerge. Or perhaps you need most the wisdom of the black bear who has prepared for this, who has eaten and stored and slept. And while she sleeps, who is growing new life. Maybe the honeybees, those creatures who understand beyond understanding that the only way we make it is if we make it together. Let the lessons of this wild world be a guide for you during this season. Whether the wisdom you need is from the black bear, huddled up and letting her wise body feed new life, or from the honeybees who shiver together, sacrifice together, stay warm together, 
or from the painted turtle whose very body dissolves inside her shell, trusting the cold and the inevitable thaw, or from the turkeys who call to one another like a choir, saying, we will make it through. Let the lessons of the season guide you. May it be so for you and so for us all. Amen. Will you join us in our hymn number 55, in our gray hymnal, Dark of Winter. Thank mm -hmm. you. 